Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining today. Welcome to Inclusive Spaces seminar series here at the Bartlett, uh, the Faculty of Built Environment at UCL. So I'm Ava Branscom, an associate professor at the Bartlett School of Architecture. I'm delighted to be chairing the session today. Inclusive Spaces is a monthly online event series led by the Bartlett Equality, Diversity and Inclusion group, the EDI group. And within this uh, program, we explore disability, race, gender, LGBTQ+, and many other dimensions of diversity. And in our sessions, we discover how they intersect with the built environments globally. Our topic in this January edition is about housing inequality and heritage and the embedded structural problems within the built environment. Uh, this is an urgent issue, and I'm really passionate about this. So. It is really wonderful to see so many of you joining us today. And um, just a few housekeeping details before we actually begin. Um, so just to let you know that the session will be recorded and added to the faculty's YouTube channel, as well as to the EDI website. And it will also be forwarded to all people who are registered to attend today. This session is captioned live by a professional captioner. And if you wish to view the caption on a separate browser window, please click on the link shared in the chat. Um, in the first half of the session, we will be hearing the presentations by our panelists. Um, so welcome in on, on your screens. Uh, uh, the first um, person is uh, Priya Agarwal Shah, and she's the founder and director of BAME in, in Property. Welcome. Uh, the second presentation will be by myself and my work with uh, in public engagement as an academic um, with the Spit Theater Company. And um, and so I'll give the second presentation. And finally, we'll have Naomi Israel, um, who is a co-chair at the Spit Theater Company, and who will be telling us. Um, how this will be, uh, um, how, how the Spit Theater uh, Company works from the side of the young people. Um, and it's a real pleasure to, to work, to welcome all of you today. So um, in this Inclusive Spaces event, uh, together we will explore the role that architecture, planning and public engagement can play in addressing racial inequalities and differences in housing and living arrangements across ethnic communities. And we'll hear from BAME in Property, an organization that advocates for change of the built environment sector. BAME in Property's work considers diversity in design needs, layouts, and language translation through engagement with community and ethnic minority leaders. Um, then we'll present the work of the community theater group SPID, that stands for Social Progressive Interconnected Diverse. And SPID provides training to young people from North Kensington in London using uh, cultural and artistic activities in order to empower them to interpret and better understand their own urban environments. And following this, um, these presentations, we will begin the Q&A and open up the discussion for you to participate in as audience. Do please submit a question at any point during the event by clicking on the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and then we will uh, end the program uh, promptly at 2 p.m. So with uh, no more delays, let's get started. Priya, over to you. Please, can you start to share your screen, and uh, let's hear about Bayman Property first. Thank you so much for that introduction, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, really pleased to be here. I will just share my screen. So hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, just a little bit more about Bayman Property. Um, this is an organization to help bring more ethnic diversity to the property and planning sectors. It started off as a networking organization and over the last two and a half years, we offer, we've been offering a range of services, including job advertising, um, EDI, consultancy. We do community engagement through a culturally sensitive lens. And we also still continue to hold workshops and events as well. And for the purpose of this particular seminar, we'll be looking at data, census data, and really just trying to understand why it's so important to understand 
what is around us in society to ensure that we have better policy and better inputs. So I'd like to first start by sharing some key findings from the uh, 2021 census regarding ethnicity and religion. So this is something that I've been following for quite some time since the data has been published by the ONS and there's been some really, really astonishing findings. So we've seen some huge changes over the last sort of 10, 11 years. And one of them is that one in six people living in England and Wales were born outside of the UK, which is a huge increase of 2.5 million since 2011. And I think this just goes to show that we really do have a changing face of England and Wales, which is where the census took place. The other um, sort of data which, uh, which has really, really changed is that the proportion of non-white people has now risen to 18.3% in England and Wales. Um, this was 14% in 2011 when the last census took place. So again, you know, we are seeing more ethnic minority communities all across the UK. And in particular, London, um, just under two thirds of people identify with an ethnic minority group. And in 2011, this figure was around 41%. We've already known that London is already a melting pot of diversity, huge multi multiculturalism everywhere that you go from Harrow to um, you know, Hackney and to sort of Walthamstow, all these different areas, hugely diverse. But I think that the census data just confirms that. And outside of London, we've also got other cities where the ethnic minority population is now in the majority. So the ethnic minority population is around 60% in Leicester. A large part of this population is because of the um, East African Asians that were expelled from Uganda in the 1970s. Quite a lot of them came to Leicester, settled there, built up their businesses. And now in 2023 now, we've got you know, a, a population in Leicester, which is primarily South Asian. Birmingham, 51.4%. And this is a city where 20 years ago, seven out of 10 people were white. So not only are we seeing majority minority ethnic cities, but just the rapid change, um, you know, is just um, something to note as well. You know, we are seeing not just huge changes in the ethnic minority population, but just the, the you know, sort of rate of how this is happening is also something to note as well. And finally, interestingly, in the census, we've seen some, you know, different, we've seen some huge changes with religion as well. So we've seen a 5.5 million drop in the number of Christians and a 44% rise in the number of people following Islam. So that's huge. I think this will tell us a lot about the areas as well. I think ethnicity and religion are also very closely related. And something else, for the first time in our census, we've also had people um, sort of describe themselves um, with no religion as well. So I think that's also really interesting as well. We've, we've got people who are identifying differently as well. This is gonna have a huge implication on planning and engagement, but also on buildings and infrastructure as well. We're gonna start seeing maybe some different religious infrastructure around us. We're gonna start seeing more ethnic minority shops. In London, for example, if you look at some of the TFL uh, tube stations, we've already got some tube stations where the language is in um, sort of different, different languages. So look at Whitechapel, they've got it in Bengali. Whitechapel is an area with a huge Bangladeshi population. Um, go to the other side of London, in West London, you've got Southall and they've got Southall in Punjabi. So it just goes to show how as communities become more ethnically diverse or just diverse in general, you start to have infrastructure and sort of social elements reflecting that diversity as well. But really what we need to understand is what impact this has on planning and engagement. Um, first and foremost, different cultures and communities live in different ways. Um, so multi-generational living is particularly common in many regions in Asia, Africa, and Eastern Europe. And we also see that phenomenon in the UK as well. So in areas where there are large sort of Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi populations, they do tend to live in larger families, but they don't necessarily have larger homes. So if you look at local plans, there's usually an allocation for the number of houses, but that doesn't necessarily meet how big families are. So that's gonna be something which we now need to start considering that local plans, planning inspectors will also need to start thinking about as well. 
New builds don't always accommodate larger families due to their size and cost. I think one of the things that I've noticed certainly when looking around new builds is that they're always that little bit smaller. They tend to get smaller, but they are more expensive nowadays. And a lot of them don't come with gardens, um, especially if they're if they're flats. And if you do want to buy a new build house, they're you know hugely hugely expensive. So again, they don't necessarily meet the housing demands of what we need today. Some new builds have design features which don't necessarily um, which aren't necessarily desirable for some ethnic minority communities. So such as an open plan kitchen, some people would rather have at least some sliding doors between their kitchen and their living area just to prevent odors going around the house a lot more quicker. Then there can be issues with the way that the bedrooms are set out. There needs to sometimes be sort of separate female and male areas in some housing, especially in, in, in Muslim communities, the toilet or the bathroom needs to be facing in certain directions. So all of these things will need to now start being considered uh, within planning and engagement. And our current retirement living doesn't always suit ethnic minority communities. We've got lots of retirement living all across the country. We have an aging population. We are gonna need more retirement living homes. But one of the reasons why multi-generational living is still so common in this country amongst ethnic minority communities is because the retirement living tends to be suited primarily for sort of white British needs. So there might not be a halal kitchen or there might not be halal options offered in a retirement living complex. There might not be vegetarian kitchen, um, uh, vegetarian options. There may not be carers who speak different languages, uh, languages. All of these things have to be considered when you are thinking about whether older people should be in retirement living complexes. So over time, we will need to start thinking about how we diversify our retirement living homes to ensure that they are meeting the needs of different communities as well. But to, under, but to ensure that we have culturally sensitive homes and engagement approaches, we first need to understand the challenges that ethnic minority communities face with housing. And this brings me to the circle of inequalities. And as you can see in this circle, we've got in the middle structural racism and inequalities pretty much underpins everything, whether you're looking at housing or you're looking at health. But all of these different areas, home ownership, shared ownership, access to finance, multi-generational housing, overcrowding, exposure to pollution and homelessness. If you are from an ethnic minority community, you are likely to experience all of these issues far more than if you are white British. Now, of course, there is the added layer of class, and you know, if you add class and race together, you are facing sort of double, double barriers, double prejudices. But just to sort of go into some of these into more detail. So interestingly, in the UK, it is actually Indians which have the highest level of home ownership at around sort of 70, 70 odd percent. Then it's followed by white British. Black people have the lowest number of sort of home ownership when it, when it comes to being able to get onto the ladder. And I think one of the biggest challenges is access to finance. So, you know, some, some Black people have found that trying to access finance has been more challenging than their white counterparts when it's come to sort of viewing homes. There has been some sort of prejudice against them. So we know that that racism definitely exists. Only this week, there was a Newsbeat report which showed that Black people were being rejected when it came to sort of renting as well. So there's definitely issues with regards to housing. When it comes to access to finance, some communities have certain religious restrictions as well. So in some Muslim communities, they have to have Islamic finance, which means that they can't have that kind of interest attached to it. Now, as we've seen from the census data, we have seen a huge increase in the number of um, individuals identifying with Islam. So are we going to need more Islamic finance options? When it comes to multi-generational living, this is where sort of you know, you've got grandparents, you've got parents, you've got children, maybe even aunts and uncles all living in the same household. You know, there can be huge benefits to this. There can be that kind of transferring of knowledge and of you know sort of wisdom and that kind of language, which is fantastic. It, it you know it isn't always um, an unpleasant experience. In fact, it, it can actually be quite a nice experience. Where multi-generational living really came into the forefront was during the COVID-19 pandemic, where we saw that it was that it that it that it was quite difficult to actually isolate different generations. There might have been challenges with broadband because more people were working from home. And it was also, it, it can also be challenging to have your private space as well when you're living with so many different family members in the household. 
And obviously, you know, multi-generational living can lead to overcrowding, you know, where it's not done by choice, but it's done out, uh, out of force because you aren't able to obtain a larger home or your children aren't able to move out. And overcrowding, as we know, has huge implications as well. The exposure to pollution is a really interesting one because where you live is just as important as how you live. Um, we've, we've, we've seen over the last few years that, you know, being exposed to poor air quality can have a huge impact on your health. Um, it can even lead to death in the, in the case of Ella Kissy Deborah, who unfortunately died because she was exposed to really poor air quality. But also, um, you know, poor, poor housing can be in the sense of mold. And as we know, again, in the news, there was the two-year-old child um, who died because of mold in his household. And this is more apparent within shared ownership and within sort of social housing, underpinning all of these challenges is that there is one common feature is that most of these communities are ethnic minority. And even more than that, most of them are black. So if you are black, not only do you have um, sort of some unfortunate chances when it comes to obtaining your own home, but you are also exposed to issues like overcrowding, to health issues and potentially even homelessness as well. So statistics have shown that black people back in 2011 only made up 3% of the population, but made up 14% of all homelessness stats. So th this just goes to show that all of these different areas are completely intertwined. You cannot think about housing without thinking about health and without thinking about racism, which completely underpins all of this. So how can you make a difference? I just wanted to touch upon a few of these. This is what I call my kind of uh, tree, which you know has all these roots and all these different branches leading onto different solutions and suggestions. Underpinning all of these is diversity and inclusion, which is really what should be guiding your overall strategy for reducing housing inequalities. So first and foremost, you know, engaging with different demographics. How many times have you you know gone to a public consultation if you work in this space and you tend to get you know, a sort of similar demographic coming most of the time, you know, the over 50s, they're saying, look, not in my backyard, your classic NIMBYs saying, look, why are you building homes over here? But have we actually thought about the fact that we probably need to be engaging with the younger audience, those who are maybe struggling to get onto the housing ladder, those who probably need a home, those who probably have some different priorities. So we probably need to be thinking about not just engaging with different demographics, but also diversifying how we are engaging with them. So no longer are we going to start having just sort of town hall events, but we need to start thinking about online engagement, you know, doing it on um, social media as well, where we have a much younger demographic. TikTok has really seen a surge in the number of people who are promoting different things, but it's clearly a sort of platform to reach out to a different audience. Recruitment of local representatives. This is really important because you need local advocates who can really speak on your behalf and really promote what you're going to do and what you're trying to advocate as well. So I think, you know, finding people who do believe in what you're doing, particularly younger people who can actually then go around and say, look, you know, we think we need new housing in this area. We need some different options. We need some different tenures. We think it's really important that you get on board. And that's just another way of getting people on side culturally sensitive um, and accessible community engagement is also really important. So I just talked about online engagement. Online engagement is really important to be reaching perhaps a younger audience, but that doesn't mean that you use that you lose that face to face option. Face to face will always be really, really important for an audience that isn't online, that doesn't have access to the Internet or just, you know, needs to have that face to face interaction. And, you know, nothing can really be replaced when you sort of speak to someone, you bring them on side and you sort of have that interaction with them. Culturally sensitive is sort of knowing different people's needs. So if you're going into an area, you know, where it's a primarily Jewish population, you know that you, that, you, that you may want to avoid holding public engagement on a Friday evening or on a Saturday because of Sabbath. You know, if you go into a Muslim area, again, you may want to think about, you know, do you need to separate male and female if that is the preference? One of the ways of being culturally sensitive is by liaising and engaging with local community leaders or with religious leaders, actually going and just being, being a bit slower with your approach and actually understanding through these local leaders, you know, what is it that the community wants, how is best to engage with them, learning from the experts, so not actually assuming anything, but listening to what local people have to say. 
inclusive and culturally mindful design. So I spoke earlier of the need of, you know, thinking about some design adaptations because of our changing population. Well, this is where you have to start thinking about it in the planning and design of your um, buildings as well. And actually having design workshops where you're getting views from different communities, especially different ethnic communities, and you're asking them, you know, what is it that is important to you? What are your priorities? What would you like to see in the design of homes? Do we need to be, you know, having these sliding doors between the kitchen and the living area? And this is not about inconveniencing developers, but this is actually about bringing in, you know, modifications into buildings which might actually be desirable for quite a large population you know I would assume that having sliding doors between your kitchen and your living area might be a feature that many more communities want not just you know South Asian communities. Supplier and partnership diversity is also really important especially when it comes to sort of working in local areas you may want to consider working with you know local construction workers who actually know the area really really well you might want to think about who you partner with when it comes to your CSR and your social value as well because again that can give you an indication of diversity and inclusion and what is important and finally diversify your marketing I can't stress enough like if you want to attract different people and different demographics to your engagement and to get involved you need to speak to this audience your vibe attracts your tribe after all and you need to make sure that you've got people who look like the people that you want to have coming along to your events or having um engagement with you so th these are just some of the things that we can do we will be talking about these more during the q a session and during the discussion but i just wanted to leave you with this to see um you know what else we might want to explore in this space um, and that's me finished. So thank you. And I'll pass it back to Ava. Well, thank you so much, Priya. That was really fascinating and really, really important. That that was so insightful and to have the, these actual facts there and not just people's, um, you know, kind of impressions. Um, do please submit any questions you might have um, in the Q&A and we will then answer them following on from the presentations. So I'm the next um, with my presentation about my work with, as an academic with the Spit Theatre Company in North Kensington and I will start sharing my screen here. Okay. So I hope you see that okay. Um, so um, just to sort of explain um, who SPID is, the SPID Theater Company is based out of the former community room um, in the Great Two Star listed Kensal House Estate in North Kensington. And the group moved into this abandoned space in 2005. Over the years, a SPID have turned the damp, cold, and very basic facility into a vibrant uh, community hub. And the programs are funded and supported um, by the Heritage Lottery Fund, the BBC Children's in Need, um, the Mayor of London, Arts Council England, Historic England, and the Targeted Prevention Team and more groups. And this makes it possible for SPID to develop its program with experts in their field, such as from the British Library, the VNA, and has also made possible my own involvement. Uh, the value of this initiative as a community hub has earned SPID the status of an asset of community value. Since 2012, I've been running workshops and advising on the program of the SPID Theater Company uh, devised by Nena Sampson, who unfortunately can't be here today to discuss her, her work and her contribution. Uh, the rooms were still very uncomfortable when I was first asked to run architecture-based workshops for young people, and the age span ranged from 13 to 25, so quite large. And this work is important for me personally in terms of widening the outreach of architectural education to underrepresented groups and giving them an understanding about their city and uh, enabling through this also pride in the environments that they inhabit. I'm very interested in housing injustice and how we can better understand this through the history of their architectural environments and also the role that heritage and regeneration play. From the start, this collaboration um, uh, with SPID has intersected with my research and teaching here at the Bartlett. 
And my research and writing concentrates particularly on the intersection of architecture and media, such as exhibitions and publications and photography, as well as museum architecture as a cultural and urban hinge and driver for regeneration. These topics intersect with my extensive experience in British architectural heritage. And I have spent almost a decade as a caseworker for the 20th century society, uh, this uh, heritage group. And more than 50 individual buildings and larger sites have been listed due to my work as a caseworker and heritage activist. And you can see some of my cases here on the screen. And so it was through my link with heritage that I became involved in the work of the Spit Theater Company. Um, as public engagement, and they're based here at uh, the Kensal House that is located here, on, and you can see it. Um, although architecture is an integral part of human experience, its pedagogy, as discussed in universities or by specialist groups such as like the 20th Century Society, etc., offers a little access to frameworks that might also allow diverse groups of young people a better understanding of their own built urban environment and helping them through this to empower to situate and orient their diverse identities. To counteract this deficiency, the Spit Theater Company in North Kensington have run a program of workshops using the context of 20th century social housing estates. And as their workshop leader for architectural history and heritage, I have helped to underpin different outputs ranging from site-based performances uh, to radio shows. In Spitz interdisciplinary program, the young people are taught basic research skills, um, how to interview residents and write scripts, make films or curate exhibitions, and how to combine all of these into site-specific performance tours of significant modernist estates here in London. So what was happening here was not just learning through his, uh, you know, history through architecture. Um, the young people also were gaining very important transferable life skills, things like how to be on time or how to talk to people with confidence and to be proud of their urban environment that they were starting to understand as part of the activities. To begin with, I knew very little about the area and was surprised that the nation's most affluent borough had this pocket of poverty, lack of opportunity and deprivation. Today, um, the gentrification of North Kensington is increasingly squeezing out social housing and the diverse demographics that live there. The Spit Theater Company has al was always very concerned about the gradual but progressive social cleansing of the area through this. And then in 2017, a Grenfell, um, the, the fire at Grenfell happened. But let's go back to look at the history of this part of London. So on this slide, you can see the Charles Booth poverty map from the late um, 1890s and North Kensington is here in this highlighted area and um, it's larger here. Um, I think this map is very good uh, in explaining the serious disparity in living standards of this area from the earliest of time. And uh, if you can see my cursor, so the yellow areas, this is actually the hill of Notting Hill. Um, the yellow area is very affluent, is the top class of residency and inhabitation. Um, then uh, you can see how that area is, is then surrounded by sort of bright red, that's still um, 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 a comfortable middle class, which at the time that the map was made in the 1890s would have included several uh, uh, servants and staff that would work in these houses. And then you can see that it very quickly becomes paler and fades into blue and black. And these are areas of um, rife in deprivation and poverty. So these neighborhoods then became developed in the 1960s as post-war slum clearance initiative. But already from the very beginning, and that's what this map shows, these communities had been identifiable as pockets of poverty to do, due to migration and urban displacement. Grenfell Tower was part of this welfare state's rehousing uh, program. Um, and the designs for Grenfell Tower started in 1967 and construction went up in uh, 1972 and the building was complete two years later. And so the, the tower is here, but 
the estate is also these uh, um, sort of mid-rise housing, housing blocks. But in the area of North Kensington, there was another slum that had been a tenacious area of poverty since North Kensington was developed for housing in the mid 1800s. And this area was the result of overspeculation. So we can see what happened here in the, you know, 100 years later. Um, in the 1950s, um, for example, Power Square uh, became. Um, the heart of Peter Rackman's notorious slum empire. And these homes uh, were then also rented out to the Windrush generation as part of the same strategy of exploitation. Then the White Defense League moved into the area and together with the Teddy Boys, they provoked the incendiary race riots in 1958. When the slum clearance started to change North Kensington, um, and also with the construction of social housing estates, the conservation movement stepped in to stop the demolition of those particular Victorian townhouses that were in this area, in the Portobello area. And soon the area became popular among young artists as part of the counterculture movement. Uh, here you can see Jimi Hendrix, who was performing there, but also lived in the area. And um, gentrification set in by the 1980s. Young professionals were attracted by the artsy feel and the cheap rundown, but also very large and attractive Victorian houses that were now under heritage protection. And since then, the neighborhood has experienced a steady but unstoppable pressure on affordable housing as properties were fixed up and sold on for higher prices, but you were also getting multi-occupancy homes um, a reconsolidating a single family homes, which you know meant that there were less less properties for rent. And then in the 1999, Roger Michelle's film Notting Hill drew the area to the attention of the a global property market, which made this even more extreme. The fire at Grenfell Tower was the result of an ill-advised attempt to make the social housing block more attractive to look at from its gentrified surroundings. After the fire, my work with SPID became primarily concerned with how architecture has been involved in spatial injustice in North Kensington and how we will be able to use the memory of Grenfell to move beyond this in future. There were votives and memorials and protest placards everywhere and the green hearts for Grenfell were literally the writing on the wall and still are actually today. The topic was tough and we realized uh, that all of us would need to ensure that the workshops for the young people would not add to the trauma that they had experienced. And then I worked hard to help the topic evolve as a well-rounded discussion covering the many complexities of North Kensington's housing situation. So the, the output, the performance was to be about having agency and looking forward. And this is their neighborhood and the young people of North Kensington should be given a toolkit to empower them also to demand change. The built environment carries great responsibilities in framing and staging social activities and reflecting underlying ideologies and power structures. So through this work with SPID, I've become increasingly interested in Grenfell Tower the deeply ingrained inequality of the area and the question of difficult heritage. And I've integrated this into my workshops for SPID, but also my teaching at the Bartlett and my ongoing research. And you can see some of this here. Finally, I'm deeply indebted to SPID and having been able to work on their projects over the years. It has been inspiring to be able to share my enthusiasm with them by thinking about history and identity through buildings. Um, and I'm always deeply humbled to then see this reworked into the beautiful and joyful performative site based enactments. While the young people perform their immediate history and reality, the workshops simultaneously embed deep layers of resilience as they start to experience themselves as meaningful participants of their city. As such, my work with Nana as a creative and experimental method of public engagement is about challenging presumptions about architecture being an exclusive practice ring fenced by privilege. Thank you. 
I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, good. So um, uh, now let's hear from Naomi, um, who is an active participant uh, of SPID. Um, yes, do you want to uh, uh, come on? Thank you very much for turning your camera on. So, um, so over to you. Um, uh, tell us a little bit more about, uh, um, uh, you know, who you are and how you got engaged with SPID and what this means to you. Hi, I'm sorry. Can you say that again? Because <laughs> my internet went a bit. Yeah, no worries. So, haywire. so first, first of all, uh, welcome Naomi. Um, and uh, um, um, and just tell tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you became active in SPID and and what it means to you to be part of these workshops. Um, okay, um, I, I'm, my name's Naomi, um, I'm co-chair of SPID Theatre. I joined SPID when I was a teenager. Um, it was, uh, what attracted to me initially was the acting. Um, so yes. the workshops. That's because, what I did yeah. initially. Yes. And th so the, it was acting that drew me on to it. And then the workshops was what we did the acting into it. And then um, I went to university and then I came back and um, then Grenfell happened. Um, and I lost friends and, and people I, I truly cared about. And um, well, I had more questions than answers and mainly why and how. So with the knowledge I gained from SPID in terms of understanding social housing and all the aspects that comes with it, be it political, be it historical and um, the, the, all the implications that happened in order for it to be the cluster that it, it, it was, Trying my hardest not to swear. <laughs> um, yeah, that's essentially um, everything I learned from the workshops was gave me the information to understand basically how my friends died and the series of events that led up to their death. And um, I needed to know this because it was part of my grieving process. So. Um, that's one of the things that was really helpful for me as a as a young person in the community that is also in social housing so it's also it, it was empowering to understand um my surroundings and my home and to understand the nuances of of it to be able to basically better protect what i the place i live in and to understand how it works because you know in order to play the game you know gotta know the rules so um yeah that was yes. a long yeah. way of answering Yeah, no, question. thank you very much, Naomi. And, uh, um, and you know, you and I have met over several occasions and, and I'm always, you know, I, 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 I feel with you and also going into the area of North Kensington and seeing the, still seeing the tower there and that is now mm -hmm. behind sort of plastic sheeting and and that you know it's 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 a very difficult thing to kind of try try to heal while the building is still there in this kind of kind of situation, um, mm. and and how uh, but also when you're walking through to North Kensington, it's very evident how how you know polarized the communities there are as well. And and uh, um, and yeah, the. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you if you wanna if you wanna say something about that as well, and and uh, um, I don't know the kind of the role that architecture plays as well. Um, the polarities wasn't exactly lost on me prior to Grenfell, or something that um, I was very aware of. There was this there's a street that me and my sister we we, we call it Posh Grove. <laughs> it's like when you go past Labrick Grove and then you go towards Labrick Road. That's where we have all those lovely big Victorian homes. Um, we call it Posh Grove. Um, so it's it's not something that was lost on me, especially since that street is very close to Grenfell. The 
the inequality is has always been there. It's just it's it was it's, it's sort of like a blinker you'll miss it if you, if you go about your life as we do as Londoners. We're very you know to the point about our business going our way and just what is there is there and we get on with it. But it's only when you're really confronted with it that you realize, oh wait, no, there was really it really is a lot of inequality in this in this sector of the world I live in, and it's 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 it's, it's I find it fascinating how you know the the rich and the poor just coexist and go about their business, and then um, when such a disaster happens, it's it it shocked me. One, just just how much of the inequality it was, because it was always one thing to know, but to the, to the degree I was not aware. And two, um, just 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 how yeah, we may be very different, and we we some have privilege, some don't. But it it was it was comforting to see that how everyone came together in that moment, to, and did and basically just did what the people in power were supposed to do which was to lead they yeah, didn't so the they community didn't started lead, to so. take the community exactly. started to take over at that point didn't it yeah because it was there was no leadership from those who should be leading so the community came and led themselves and it was it was rich or poor um privileged to the non-privileged that came together and and did what needed to be done and i i i love that about my area mm-hmm. well that's that's really lovely to hear Naomi and also that that even though there is such a kind of wide disparity in North Kensington that that there is still a community feeling that there is solidarity if something goes really wrong like that 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 uh, you know people come together as one regardless of what their backgrounds are of of class and race and different occupations and you know, and uh, where they might live within this uh, um, within this part of London. So yeah, okay. Um, so, and I think perhaps just back to to oh Naomi. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Um, so I ju- I just just one kind of last thing. So um um w- when you started uh, working with Spid, um. You know, just just uh, perhaps uh, um, uh, let us know a little bit more about you know how how you feel now that you're also um, in a more not just somebody taking part in the workshops but also part of the organization. How how meaningful that is to you? How that works for you? Um, that might be nice to hear. Oh, majorly, um, it's it's majorly important for me because it, I'm I'm in a position where I can advise them on how to further spread. The word of SPID and how to let young people know that it, it exists because I, I found it by happenstance <laughs> and um, I was just happened to be at the right place at the right time and um, got approached and was like hey we have this thing do you want to join us like, yeah great but um, so I'm able to advise them on how to reach young people on the wider scale and get them involved because like I said knowledge is power and yeah. it's, 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 it's great to, to know these things because if you know how things are and how it's run and how it's done and how people um and how how spaces like spid were at risk of being taken away from the community then you're best placed to prevent that from happening to other spaces as well because especially for young people we don't have a space of our own it's always forever being co-opted or taken away from us or or um we, or underfunded to the point that it can no longer be um viable then they have an excuse to ship it away so yeah. um yeah that's why it's so important to to know these things and um to to know what's out there and also in a way know how to fight for your rights yeah and protect what's what's ours the community because forever i don't know what it is about this government they love to forever privatize and sell things off so again knowledge is power yeah 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 and i mean also i think it's really important one of the things that i was very impressed by is that the workshops are for free for the young people I, yes. you know, I think that's they're just free people go they're free yeah they're free <laughs> you know they don't cost any anything and and people can join and and just be part of it and and you know also become part of the community if you know for however long they feel like it and like with you sort of join as a quite a young person then your life moves on you go to university and then you come back 
in this other role and it's teaching you also to take leadership which i think is yeah, also i need to add another thing it also you also learn about other people's experiences within the area because mm-hmm. uh, when when we go and we do um we uh, go and we meet people in the community and we record their um just their experiences within the community because that's what we do well we, we, we fix on them um, a property we learn about it it's usually social housing and we learn about it we interview the people who live we live within it or around it and then we formulate a play based on that including the information that we've learned so you're also learning about like gaining skills and in interviewing people and learning about their lives and also making that into a play and, and or a film so yeah Okay, good. Thank you so much, uh, Naomi. Please stay with us on the screen. And I'm, uh, I'd like to invite Priya back uh, for the Q&A and the discussion. Um, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Naomi, for, for this, which was uh, really important to hear from you. So, um, uh, so let's start with a question for Priya. Um, it's from Saif Osmani. And um, the question is, What's your view on the over-provision of luxury flats in London? Thank you for your question. I think I'm going to interpret that as, you know, what do we think of gentrification um, all across London? What are we thinking of, you know, sort of very expensive high-rise blocks? You're thinking, you know, your, your nine, nine elms with that pool in the sky. That's kind of, you know, what's what we're seeing a lot more of. And I think what's happening is that we've got a lot of overseas investors who are you know, purchasing these properties, but not necessarily living in these high priced, high value luxury flats. And they end up just being empty. And what we have in, in London especially is a housing crisis where a lot of local people are being outpriced of their local areas and they're not able to afford, they're not even able to get onto the housing ladder. They can't even afford shared ownership because yes, you might get a discount with shared ownership, but it's still quite expensive. And I think what, what we're seeing as, as we keep building, as developers keep building more and more luxury apartments, buildings, flats, you know, just ordinary people won't be able to get onto the housing ladder by, by any stretch. I think, so my opinion of them is we probably need to have a greater mixture of housing. I think developers tend to provide luxury buildings in a um, sort of block because it's a viability assessment and they need to be able to you know have those luxury apartments in order to then provide discounted options such as partnering with a social housing provider or to provide more affordable options so there is a sort of viability reason why they provide these luxury uh, flats but we probably have too many luxury flats which are just lying empty in proportion to the number of people that actually need a home good yeah thank you um that that was good and clear. Um, I have a, a question for uh, just a comment for Naomi from uh, Lisa Fletcher, who says, Naomi, I think you are amazing and your passionate response to the Grenfell disaster is very clear, as is your dedication to the community there. Uh, I'm doing a drama pr- uh, processional piece in Waltham Forest and would love to learn from your drama workshops, et cetera. So there you go, you have a contact um, that, uh, you know, where, where you can make some connections yourself and connect with other community groups. Um, there's also a question from Skylar Smith, who says, thank you for um, sharing, Naomi. How do you find the community rooms that SPID work in, in at Kensal House? Would you prefer bigger, better space or does it serve a location spe- uh, specific purpose? Um, well, we're in currently in the middle of a refurb. So we're making the space lo- slightly larger and, be- and better fit for purpose, not just for theatre, but also for the wider community and mainly the, build- the um, residents of Kensal to use as well. So um, watch the space. <laughs> Good. Let's uh, let's see. Um, um, perhaps this one is. Oops. Perhaps this one is uh, uh, one. Perhaps for me. Um, it's from uh, Anirut uh, Sharan. 
um, who writes, hi, thank you for this wonderful session. I'm an architect from India, wow, and interested in working with adaptive reuse. I had a question regarding it. While working with the prevent preventing demolition of old buildings, how does one preserve the local characteristics and yet refrain from reinforcing the complicated social past inequalities that they represent? That That is a very interesting and uh, um and and very pertinent question and i think um you know with kind of adaptive reuse with with keeping older buildings um we do need to start thinking about the complex histories that they embody in their evidence for um and as perhaps also contested sites like what you're saying um you know complicated you know if you keep the building it will it might through its its kind of physicality um, also maintain um, complicated social pasts and inequalities, and and I think I think it's important that that this is always laid very clear when when a, a building is to be um, put under historic protection or um, you know brought into a new life that um, the new life doesn't just ignore what the building was about in the past, but actually properly engages with it so that uh, it becomes readable as, as a certain layer in, in, the, in the historic environment. Um, and uh, um, I mean, I don't know, uh, Priya, do you have something to say about that, about, uh, um, you know, um, the, the continued inhabitation of, of buildings? I'm actually going to flip this question um, right back to you because I have seen in the Q&A a really interesting question um, from Alex Alex Kearney um, about receptive developers, which I'd really like to take okay, on after. Go ahead, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. I okay. Will, yeah. No, please answer that one. Yes. Amazing. Yeah. So this is a question which is asking how receptive developers and other partners have been to the recommendations of Fame and Property. Is it possible to hear more about their work in this area? So I think once upon a time, um, certainly developers weren't receptive to culturally sensitive engagement approaches. Um, I think it was very much a case of a tick box exercise. Let's get our community and our stakeholder engagement done to the bare minimum so we can get our planning application over the line. Obviously, in order to submit a planning application, you need to have that statement of community involvement. But I think in the last sort of 10, probably even five years, we've seen a real shift in developer attitudes where they're recognizing that the communities that they're going into are incredibly diverse. They are working with more and more minority communities and they cannot turn a blind eye to different community needs and priorities. So I think developers are certainly more open to considering different engagement approaches, certainly liaising with community and religious leaders, um, sort of thinking about online engagement. That's definitely seen a resurgence, certainly during the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, where everything went online, including engagement. There were some um, projects that I worked on which were 100% online. Uh, because we couldn't meet in person and it just meant that we were able to reach a much wider demographic and I think now what we're going to see is hybrid approaches where we will have online engagement, we'll have in-person events, we'll have some design workshops, we'll think about language translation because we absolutely need to with the sort of diversity of the UK and how it's shifting and we probably also need to think about um, the census data and how this will impact future engagement strategies as well. So I'm currently working with a housing association up north um, where we have to think about sort of some different approaches as well. So I would say that developers are certainly starting to come on board and definitely starting to adopt um, some of those recommendations that Bayman Property has suggested. Thank you, Priya. That's That's really... Good to hear that that um, things are starting to move in in the right direction. So, the, you know, linking it back to your own important work. So these were some really wonderful questions, everyone. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, we are running out of time and we'll have to wrap up our section, uh, our session now. Um, I'll be looking through the chat at the questions and so will uh, Priya and Naomi as well. And, and it'll be giving us a really good and very important 
um, uh, kind of feedback for our continued thinking and our relevance and perhaps, uh, you know, to push our own thinking in, in perhaps slightly different directions that we hadn't considered before. So thank you very much. Um, so, um, you know, Naomi and uh, Priya, thank you uh, for um, coming along and uh, your insightful discussions and also thank everybody. I'd like to thank everybody for coming along and joining us today. Uh, just one last thing to mention is that SPID will be uh, at the British Film Institute with a film and performances uh, launching their season of social change on Saturday, the 4th of February. And as well as this, they are now signing up for free workshops starting on the 18th of March. Uh, and the flyers are included in the chat, so do have a look if you want to be part of this. And um, so this concludes this, this session and is, re is really all we have time for. Um, Inclusive Spaces is back next month on Wednesday, the 22nd of February celebrating LGBTQ plus history month um, with the editors of Queer Spaces and Atlas of LGBTQIA plus places and stories and colleagues from the Bartlett. All sign up details are on our webpage and also in the chat, of course, and we definitely hope to see you back for this event as well. Thank you for so much for being part of this Priya and Naomi and um, also thank you Alma. Um, who has been organizing this event and um, you have been absolutely great and so much support. And also um, a big thanks to all of you who have come along to, to join us today. And we hope that you enjoyed the session. Have a lovely rest of the day from all of us here and goodbye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>